Hey there, hey there, folks. My name is Eric Wilkinson. We're going to be doing a webinar series here, and it is going to be your options guide. In order to crack the code to trading options, this is the place you need to be, folks, because we're going to be talking about some of the nuances of the options that most folks out there just kind of overlook, and that's why they get in so much trouble. That's why there is so much misunderstanding around options is because folks just haven't had somebody really tell them what's going on with these options pricing at any given time. But for you folks, by the end of this, because I build from simple concepts to real life examples, by the end of this, I think you'll have a solid understanding as to why these levers and pulleys are making these prices jump around, especially in times like this. So without further ado, like I said, I am going to be building from simple concepts to real life examples in this video of our cracking the code to trading options here. And we are going to be doing it specifically on, I'm making sure that you guys are getting my screens there. Yes, you are, I think I'm sharing that. Um, so I wanna be doing this video on the short call butterfly. It is a little bit different folks than most other option strategies out there. As a matter of fact, I'd like to have people think of the butterfly as like a real butterfly. It starts out as one thing and it morphs into something different. So when you're looking at it, it's not necessarily what you expect, a caterpillar flying in a sense. But with this one, a lot of times what we would wanna do, you guys have already watched about half of this webinar series already. So you guys know volatility is one of these drivers of pricing and probably the main driver of pricing. Usually what that means is when volatility is extremely high, that means pricing is extremely high and you want to sell or short, short call spreads, things like that, short put spread. Well, we got a short call butterfly here, but it's going to break some of these rules here. And I'll show you why. We'll think through this using simple concepts. And then when we get to that real life example, folks, you guys are going to play, you're going to have a complete understanding of this really. But what I want to talk about with the simple concepts that may not seem so simple, when we look at the option montage page, that's the one with the calls and puts and all of those Greeks and the numbers are flashing back and forth. Well, that may be very difficult to understand when you first look at it, but if you can pause it, freeze frame it, maybe peel back that onion, we can try and make this a little simpler because this is just data transfer and data is O's and ones. It's the most streamlined way to transfer information. Okay. We used to type the stuff all out, but that is long uh, data lags. And when we peel this back, we can see that it's O's and ones, but you can also see that there's layers and layers of this. Well, that's what we're going to do when we're talking about options. We're going to go into the option montage page at the end of this webinar and by that time, I believe when you guys look in there, it won't be so intimidating. As a matter of fact, you guys are going to be uh, trying to squirrel around in there and figure out what the pricing is even before I start talking about it and what's going to happen. All right. So when we're talking about investments, I want to start from building blocks, right? We aren't just jumping straight into options, but what could be the best investment one could make? And please comment throughout this video, you guys. I've got the chat window. I'm keeping my eyes on it. Also, don't forget to you know hit the like button and stuff like that. We'll be trying to key you guys because I know not everybody has the opportunity to comment there. So I'll try and think of some uh, cheeky ways for you guys to get involved, all right? So with that said, what's the best investment one can make? Generally speaking, if you're having a conversation with somebody, your friends, your neighbors, or whoever, and you're talking about investments, what's usually the number over, number one or overarching answer that you would get from a person? I always hear is that it's a house. Has anybody else heard that when you're in a conversation with somebody? You should buy a house. It's the best investment you can make. Throw a Y over there. If everybody's had that same conversation when you're talking to somebody. They always go back to buying a house. It's not a car, although in the last year or so, a car has been a pretty darn good investment, just about anything as, as inflation has skyrocketed with those prices. But generally speaking, it kind of starts with some of the old investors. They talking, them talking about buying dirt or buying land being the best investment one can make. And I don't disagree with that. Buying land, 
is basically one of the best investments one could make. But buying the house on top of that land, not necessarily, folks. And we've seen these houses rise and fall throughout even just the last 20 years. Now, before that, there, there it was probably, you know, 30 to 50 years that we saw housing prices increases. So that that was one of those things that led people to say, hey, housing prices basically always go up. But who's watched housing prices, you know, in the last 10, 15 years? You could even say in the last year, uh, as a matter of fact. But in the last several years, we start, let's say, at 2000, you know, the dot-com bubble. Heading into that, we saw some moves to the upside. But during the dot-com crash, we actually saw housing prices come off. People needed to raise capital. And whenever people need to raise capital, folks, we see markets roll over. OK, you can see that come up as simple as margin calls um, on different products like gold. Gold, when they increase margins on gold, meaning I have to put up more money from my account in order to sustain the position. Well, that causes people to sell because they're over levered at that point. Same thing can happen for a house. People get over levered in houses. During the dot-com crash, people were losing money. They needed to raise capital. So we saw houses come off. Then we saw a pretty good rally for quite some time. A little bit of a dip, probably in 2008, we recovered. But then in 2009, we saw a massive crash, maybe almost down to around 2000. But it was the 2000, uh, probably top. I may have overdrawn this over exaggerated the move, but we did see massive corrections during the financial crisis in like say 2013. And then a parabolic move almost after that in since. And now here we are at 20, uh, 2020, let's say, and what, or sorry, 2022, I lost a couple of years. Uh, 2022, what's happening that could cause these housing prices to come off? It's interest rates, folks. As interest rates rise, that has a tendency to cause housing prices to drop, all right? And why is that? The reason why that is, well, as basic as rising interest rates are or the Fed raising interest rates is to slow down our spending, to create savers out of us. When the interest rates are at zero, there's no sense in saving, right? Uh, because you're not getting a return on that money that's sitting idle. So what the government tries to do is raise interest rates to say, you know what, I need to put some money in there so I can uh, get a little income off of that. Well, that saving slows our spending. If we slow our spending, then we call our, house, our housing prices or any type of prices have a tendency to come off because you don't have that demand anymore. All right. But another thing that happens with interest rates rising and with the housing prices uh, falling, because my house is like crooked, <laughs> uh, housing prices going down is because there's this thing called budgets, right? You and I all have budgets. All right. As a matter of fact, even multimillionaires and billionaires kind of have budgets too. Like they can't just buy anything they want because they know they have a finite amount of money. Well, you and I, we're working on a finite amount of money, whether that's a salary or trading income or whatever that is. Some people are on fixed income. Well, we have a set amount of income that we can budget for, right? Or that we could budget to spend. And generally speaking, I'm not a financial advisor here, folks, and I'm not a fiduciary. So this is just talk that basically you don't want to spend more than 25% of your monthly income on your house. You don't want to spend more than 20, you know, I just stretch it to 30 maybe, but 25, less than 25% of your monthly income is what you should be thinking of as your mortgage. So Heading into this, if I was looking to buy a house at zero interest rates, all of my money was going to principal, right? Because there was no real interest on it. Yeah, maybe a couple percentage points. But we've seen those interest rates almost double since um, basically two years ago, right? Um, so with those interest rates moving higher, that means 
that when I pay a mortgage with a higher interest rate, more money goes to the bank for giving me that loan into interest. Okay, so I have to pay the interest on it. That goes to the bank. The rest of it goes to paying off the principal of my home. Well, I can still only afford, let's say, $1,500, right? If my, uh, to, uh, to a mortgage or to uh, a mortgage or rent, I knew I was going to run out of room there, uh, mortgage or rent, right? So if interest rates go up and I have to pay something to the bank and a less goes to the, mor the uh, mortgage or the principal, well, then... I can still only afford that much, but if I am only paying off so much of principal, then I probably am buying a smaller house. Paying out the same, but I have to buy a smaller house be or a, a, a cheaper house, a less expensive house, because that budget is now going to the bank, all right? Some of that budget's going to the bank. So that means I can afford a smaller house. If I can only afford a smaller house or a, a less expensive house, then what has to happen to all the other houses that are kind of out of my market? It's brought a bunch of us out of that market. Well, they're going to come down in price. Okay. So how far down are these prices going to go? I can't tell you, uh, but I can tell you that housing prices have slowed. They haven't stopped inclining. So we haven't really gotten this dip yet. Um, but one would expect that the dip is going to come if we continue to raise interest rates and those long-term interest rates start to rise. Now, we can split hairs here all day long. Yes, I do know the yield curve inversion. I know the 10 years basically lower than, or the, the 30 year is lower than the 10 year and stuff like that. Um, yes, I know that the it is pricing in higher interest rates here in the short term because the Fed's mandate is to increase and try and slow down inflation. But the longer term, bonds, the longer term interest rate complex is telling us the Fed is going to overdo it. They're going to raise rates too much and then they're going to have to lower rates. That's why we're seeing that flip in the background. Now, I'm talking in theory here. If interest rates continue to rise, then we should see the housing prices start to come off again. All right. Unless uh, we could see wage inflation completely uh, match with the um, the regular inflation, the 9.1% we got today and, uh, you know, really, or this week showing massive inflation, I don't think you're going to get a 10% increase in your uh, wages, basically, month over month there. Um, all right. So with that said, we should expect to see housing prices drop. So if you just bought here, did you buy high and sell low? Because that's what everybody tells us we should be doing, right? When you're trading, it's so friggin' simple, folks. Just go out there and buy low, sell high. Or as Joe Terranova wrote a book about, was like, that's ridiculous. You can never buy low. It always feels like you're buying high. So go out there and buy high and sell higher. Well, that makes almost a little more sense um, because it does have a tendency to be one of those situations where you feel like when you've seen a market move, you feel like you're buying the high because you don't know what's going on out here. Everybody who is a uh, a trader on YouTube seems to know everything. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day. I can speculate on it. And that's basically what I try to do. But I don't know for sure. I would never say I know. So when we're looking at charts and we're trading and that novel idea comes out, hey, why don't you just buy low, sell high? You just buy it on the lows and you sell it on the highs. You sell, sell, right? Well, the problem is, folks, what happens to all of us when we're trading? You never get the opportunity to buy that low. You're actually waiting for the confirmation. You see the market rocket higher, right? This is usually where most folks buy. Actually, 50% of us will buy uh, at a point where it could go higher or lower. Um, so you buy there and it comes off. I mean, that seems like what happens to all of us, right? Buy what we, and we were second guessing our buy low thesis, but then it rockets off to the upside and you are a genius. What happens if you don't sell there on that high, which, you know, because you're thinking it's going to continue. I mean, folks, type a Y over there if you guys have all done this yourselves. 
You bought something on a nice run. You see it go higher. You're thinking, should I sell it here? I'll talk myself out of it. And then all of a sudden it retraces on you again, right? Right back to where you were buying or even possibly lower than where you were buying it. So you're kind of like watch, watched your profits run out the door on you, right? You get a little bit of a rebound. Now, nah, that would have been a buy low, sell high probably, but boom, sells off. Now, when you're looking at this chart and you don't see any of this, it's all a question. Well, what happens here? This is usually where most people will start to sell. So you don't buy low, sell high in this case. You bought high and sold low, right? Because you know that it gets back down to that level. Oh my gosh, it's going below the IPO or whatever. You guys come up with your thesis on it. But this is usually the panic at the disco. You bought it on a rally. You think you're a genius. Like you're, a, I don't know, a genius, how to make a genius thing. But you think you're going to sell and you don't. Uh, so the market really uh, bites you on that one. So while it seems so easy to buy low, sell high. Anybody that's ever tried has seen how difficult it can be. But what I want you guys to do is start looking at, one thing to note is, especially when you're starting to trade, all right? Some markets move uh, almost indefinitely higher. Some of them will seem like they're always in a bearish move. move. And it's difficult to find support and resistances, and I made it really easy on that one, uh, support and resistance on bullish and bearish markets, okay? It's harder to line up a lower high and a lower low sometimes to find those support and resistances. It's just not intuitive. But our brains line up things that are horizontal, or horizontal, I think I just made up a word, horizontal, and our eyes line up with that. As a matter of fact, our eyes, our brains are just, all built differently. Like when I draw those two dots right there, you know, it could be correlated to this, but at the end of the day, it still looks like a face. <laughs> all right. So our eyes pick that stuff up easily. You find faces in wall patterns or in toast. Okay. Um, salt on the freeway. I, I used to live around the St. Mary salt thing that, uh, or the Virgin Mary salt thing that appeared in Chicago at one point in time. Um, uh, and everybody thought it looked like the Virgin Mary. Um, so anyway, uh, but if we can line something up that trades sideways, usually it's a little easier for us to find support and resistances. Some of those stocks that trade sideways that I encourage folks to, you know, look into when you're first learning to trade to help you find where support and resistances are. Our eyes, like I said, line up uh, with sideways markets a little bit better, um, is IBM, Kroger, and Kellogg are a few of the good ones. Now, they aren't going to be going parabolic or anything like that, being vertical almost um, like a tech stock, but it is one of those where you'll find the ebbs and flows, okay? And that is how you start to trade or, or learn to trade. I, I tweeted something out not too long ago, and it was um, it was a few months ago before this market started correcting. And I tweeted out like, uh, can, are you considered a trader if you can uh, only buy low and sell high? Meaning, are you only a, are, are you really a trader if you can only buy on bullish moves? I would say no. Uh, I would say that's more of an investor. A trader will profit in bullish, bearish, and market neutral types of uh, environments or, or, or markets. Okay. Um, you have to be able to learn to take advantage of bearish moves as well. Think about how long we've been in a bearish move. If folks are only trying to buy and make a profit on a bullish move, they are having a very difficult year. All right. Um, so we're going to try and find something like IBM or Kroger because well, not in a, something that trades sideways. The reason why it's very difficult to come up with a price for something. As a matter of fact, I was just watching um, uh, the uh, CNBC with everybody, and they were talking about volatility and some of these other things. 
But the real key was they were talking about Apple's, um, Apple and Costco's uh, price to earnings in their multiples. I guess Costco's got like a 30 multiple on. All right. So what that means is they take basically what the stock is worth today or what they believe that stock, that company is worth. And then they do a multiple of that because it's always going to go higher is the theory, right? So Costco doing well right now. Well, of course, they're going to do just as good next year is the assumption. So let's put a multiple on these earnings and expect that they're going to increase their earnings from this year to next year by a certain percentage point. So then they come up with these prices for that stock that way. Now, when the markets or the economy slows down, now we don't necessarily expect, say, for instance, um, uh, Nordstrom's or somebody else to do very well because consumers are going to pull back on some of their spending, their extra money, right? So when that starts happening, then we are these economists and all of these uh, um, analysts will start saying, well, it's not going to have that multiple because the economy has slowed too much in order for it to be attainable. So let's roll this multiple back. Let's say cut it in half. And what does that give us as the price? And they spit out a number. That's why they're always saying, you know, it's a sell now or it's a hold and stuff because they're coming up with their multiples. And that's how they determine where they believe the stock's value is. All right. Very long winded. I know. I'm sorry. I got a little carried away there. But all I'm saying is it's very uh, difficult to determine if Apple is worth what Apple's trading based on somebody's multiple of it. It's just like it's difficult to figure out what this pin is worth between you and I. Most of you guys would. This is just a paperweight. It doesn't work. But for me, it's very valuable because I can draw all day long on my screen. All right. So that's what I, as a matter of fact, I can't draw on the screen with my finger. It just doesn't work. I need this pen. So this pen to me is very valuable. Whereas the one of you guys trying to write on your Acer or your monitor is just not going to work. Right. So when we're trying to find something that trades sideways, gives us an idea of price that is pretty consistent. Well, we look to options for that, to be quite honest. Our bullish bearish moves, we come up with those assumptions. Maybe we're chartists or maybe we uh, we tried Yoplait yogurt or something like that. And all of a sudden I want to buy some, or I'm bullish Yoplait, okay? Um, or, um, you know, Kroger came out with a new uh, cashier where basically every time you pull something off of your, off the shelf and put it in your cart, it automatically adjusts that. You never have to go through the, the uh, checkout, right? You know, you, so that could cause their prices to astronomically drop. I never have to sit in that crazy line uh, again. Well, yeah, that would make them more valuable as far as their margins would go down, all of that stuff. So while we, it's very hard to tell whether or not this is worth anything or a stock is worth anything, we come up with our bullish and bearish assumptions based on market analysis, economic analysis, the price of that underlying doesn't really tell us anything. We're just thinking it's either going to go up or down, right? Based on our assumptions. But options will give us a tell as to whether or not they are cheap or expensive at any given time. Like, I can't tell if uh, Apple is cheap or expensive right now because I just don't know what's going to happen in the next five years to tell you if it's cheap or expensive, right? I can tell you right now. You know, I've got a pretty good idea of what I believe is going to happen, but I'm not completely sure. But with options, I am very solid as to whether these options are cheap or expensive. And I'm going to explain why. We Remember the charts we were looking at? Options, the volatility charts look like this. And I'm not talking about the VIX. Actually, you could look at the VIX. We could look at the VIX. And uh, I have a chart of it, I'm sure the VIX, it is pretty much a sideways trending market. You could say when VIX gets up into the 30s, um, that is definitely high volatility. And when the VIX is down in the 14s, that's really low volatility. Historically though, folks, uh, 
teens to 20s is kind of normal. Above that, 30s is very extreme levels. But the VIX doesn't tell me if Apple's got high volatility right now. I cannot look at this chart of the VIX and say whether or not Apple is expensive or cheap. Let's just pull up NVIDIA. Like NVIDIA's got pretty low implied volatility, one would say. Apple, we could look at it. I don't know what it's going to be. Why didn't Apple work? Uh, Apple, it's got pretty high volatility, but I wouldn't know that by looking at the VIX. When we're looking at charts, we need to know where volatility is. Now, if you don't have an implied volatility chart, you could use historical volatility. I think implied volatility is the best because it's forward looking uh, as opposed to backward looking with um, with things like Apple. Uh, historical, sorry. Historical volatility is kind of backward looking. Implied volatility is forward looking. But what it does is it gives us a good gauge as to the options pricing. We know when it's at extreme levels that they are expensive. So with that said, I don't know how I got so many charts up. Um, volatility looks like this. It's sideways, right? So when it gets to extreme levels, this is where we want to sell options. And when we get down here, we want to buy options. And the reason why that is, is because all of these Greeks over in the option montage, now, yes, we're getting there. Uh, they all have a mandate, all right? And that is based on an advancement, okay? Meaning it's moving forward, moving higher, moving out in time, okay? We're not talking about backing up the truck. We're talking about moving forward. And when I'm talking about volatility, I'm always talking about implied volatility, or I will specifically say the VIX. But implied volatility, okay, for that underline. I'm not looking at Apple's implied volatility versus Tesla's implied volatility. I need to look at Apple's implied volatility, and that's it, and determine if it is at an elevated level or at a suppressed level, because the Greeks tell us it's all about an advancement of one. So this is one percentage point increase in implied volatility, all right? So every time implied volatility upticks, like in that chart I was just showing, every time we see implied volatility uptick one percentage point going from 39, we call that 40, let's say it's 40 and it moves up to 41. All of the option prices, I don't care what this underlying does, all of the options prices are going to increase in value, all right? Yes, it could be offset a little bit by the directionality, but all of the volatility is pumping up those premiums and vice versa. If the premiums go down, or sorry, if the volatility comes off, those premiums are going to go down incrementally based on that implied volatility coefficient. So every single option, every single option has implied volatility coefficient, right? So like the 100 strikes will have an implied volatility coefficient. The 130 uh, calls will have an implied volatility coefficient. So if volatility increases one percentage point, well, those 100 calls would probably increase a little bit more than the ones that are a little bit out of the money, okay? And because the, the coefficient is slightly different. But once it increases one percentage point, all of those will adjust based on that volatility coefficient, okay? Does that make sense to everybody before I move on? This, vol this volatility increases, all of those options price increases. So when we're looking at this chart and see that it's up near this elevated level, well, we know those are pretty expensive over there just based on volatility having this range that we know we can stretch this out in time. I haven't done this with this one, but let's just say, uh, oh, I have done this with this one. You know, you go out to the weeks and you'll see that it stayed in line over the since the pandemic and was pretty close to that same level pre-pandemic. Now, I'm not going to lie, volatility has increased since the pandemic a little bit. So some things have had an incremental move higher, uh, but most of them are back to normal. Let me just see if I can, you guys can throw things, throw names out there real quick of uh, names you want me to look at real quick. And we'll see if uh, I'm just thinking of Baba because they had that big breach today. Um, 
their volatility has gone an incremental higher since that pandemic. And they've had a lot of headwinds. So that one's not very good. Let's look at, uh, um, I don't know, I'm drawing a blank on any type of name, Holland. Uh, let's look at Honeywell. So Honeywell, let's just draw a line in there. Tops here, look, pre-pandemic, lows here, pretty, pretty darn close. It might be a slight nudge higher, but you can see when we draw these lines out in time over the three-year chart that it stays in line. I was trying to set myself up for something where I didn't know what was going to happen, like draw the lines in here. So um, somebody throw a name out there in the chat window. Uh, let's just look at IBM. Okay, so IBM, I don't have any lines in there. So what I would do here is do the drawing tool. A little bit different, getting a little sidetracked here. But I would, I try and do it where I touch about as many tops as I can. Yeah, it's breaking through there, but I don't really care. Uh, I didn't draw that line very good. Let me do it again. Um, I'm going to draw right there. Try and get it in there down pretty close to flat because otherwise it's going to make it look funky. Um, I'm going to... Draw this one in probably right there because that's hitting those two bottom ones. Yeah, I know I'm not really touching those right now, but we'll get it to work out once I figure out where my zero is. I'm wanting to jump. There we go. All right, so this is what I usually do. I found those two bottoms based on my line. Now I can see that that's the top and bottom. Let's just extend it to the left to see what it looks like. And then I've been meaning to do this for a couple of these videos and I keep forgetting, but there we go. Boom. What happened? Look at that. Pre-pandemic, right there in line with where we are now. So you can see that from this chart, if I were wanting to trade IBM, and I said IBM loves to trade in a sideways trending market, look how sideways this is. I mean, this is a three-year chart. It's never gone anywhere. As a matter of fact, I started trading IBM in college. This was what the first things I started trading. IBM and Walmart were my big ones. Um, IBM, I was... I was trading IBM right around 100, basically go down to 95, something like that. That's where I was looking to buy it, go up to 110, 115. I was looking to get out of it. You can go back to the 90s and check it out. It's, that's where it was. Um, but right now, our thing is right around 150 to around 100. That's the pretty much the range, maybe even 115. So um, with that said, you can see down here, volatility, no matter what IBM is doing in price, I can tell but, you know, what the pricing and the options is with this chart. They're expensive when it's up near this line and they are super cheap when it's down near this line. Okay. That makes sense for everybody. If it does, type a Y in there for me. Another example. This doesn't matter what stock it is, right? I don't care if this is X, Y, Z. It doesn't matter. This one doesn't really matter what the stock is. I'm just looking for the range that area and then try to determine if this is this line today is cheaper expensive off of that high area i don't know why i'm getting crazy chart looks like that um my pin's freaking out um let's just erase all of it you know here what one would probably start to assume is that this is going to continue to come off right so price of those is coming off in the option montage. So those are some things that you're gonna be wanting to consider as well. If you're newer to trading options or newer to trading at all and you're getting into options, wait for those extremes and then that market to want to look like it wants to roll over to the downside. Because you can see when volatility gets up near those levels, it does want to come off, right? We see spikes and valleys. So it gets down to this area, this is where you want to buy gets up here, this is where you want to sell. Now, I usually draw a line right down the middle, 50-50, above it, sell, below is buy. But a thing I wouldn't mind seeing coming from you guys is draw that 50-50 line and then maybe do another 25, split it into quarters. And then you wait for the extremes. It's the sell when it's at extreme and it's at a buy when it's at the extreme downside. That will limit your opportunities, I'm not gonna lie, but you will be capturing it at least at or near those extremes, okay? It's not meaning that you're always going to catch that top tick. No, it doesn't mean that at all. 
what it means is you're just setting yourself up for success, right? If you can catch it at that extreme, yeah, it can go against you. You'll keep your powder dry knowing that you caught it at that extreme. You won't want to panic as much to get out of it. You know, usually when people make bad decisions, it's because they aren't confident, right? They aren't sure. Well, with this, at least you can be confident in knowing that you're catching it at a pretty high price. Now, yes, most of you might be looking at this, but I say that don't bother with that so much. Yeah, maybe keep it in the back of your head to just have as a marker for the next black swan event that happens in 10 years from now or something. Then you would know that, hey, this underlying PDQ uh, is extreme levels when it gets up to this 110 area, all right? But for the most part, we look for it to be between 50 and say uh, 22 on this one. So those extremes is what you would be looking for there. I'm a little bit more aggressive with my lines. I like to have it pierce through. Now, I know a lot of chartists out there that probably got years more than me in charting is probably saying, you know, you got to clip it at, you know, these certain marks. That's not how I trade. I like to I like to make sure I have more opportunities and I'm not too concerned about an extreme going against me just a little bit. It's only going to be a couple of ticks. I would rather get in there and be ready for that 10 tick, 15 tick drop uh, when I've gotten in at a high elevated level or when I buy it at a low level, you get that explosion of volatility. I'm at least turning the tables of probabilities in my favor. Folks that are buying options way up in these levels, man, they're just, they're, they're fighting an uphill battle, man. They're, it's a Sisyphean effort. I've seen people even talking about it time and time again, you know, buying calls and Apple off of a rally. And I'm just like, volatility is through the roof right now. I mean, you're paying through the nose for those options. And despite the fact that you might be directionally right, if volatility comes out during that time, you're going to get crushed. Because we know volatility down ticks, those prices go down. Despite the fact that I bought a call that should be increasing in value. A lot of people will sit there and they're scratching their heads. They're like, why aren't I making money in this? This thing is going straight up. Well, yeah, but volatility is going straight down with it. So they're offsetting each other. So you need to make sure that you're setting your strategies up. One of the few things we can do, folks, to be successful as traders, yeah, we could chart, we could study everything, we can think we've uh, put our hours in and done our due diligence. But if you aren't setting up your option strategies for success, then you are going to be fighting an uphill battle. All right. So that's what I try and do in these videos for you folks is, you know, that's why I'm saying crack the code, crack the code. Don't be buying calls in Apple all the time. Sometimes it's the correct strategy. Don't get me wrong, but you would need, if this is Apple right now, and I don't think I have the pin ready, let's just say this is Apple. Um, and the volatility is up here. I'm saying the extreme high is there. Like this is a high area. What happens if I bought calls because I'm looking at the Apple chart? You know, the Apple chart looks like this. So I buy some calls, buy some calls on that market. And sure enough, it continues to go higher. I can't draw any higher than that, but it continues to move higher. Well, if volatility starts doing this and drops, let's say 20 percentage points, that could offset all of the gains to the upside in my trade. And I'll show you this, folks, when we get over there to the option montage. I mean, I just, I'm trying to give you guys little things, little nuggets to think about right now. Uh, before you start trading this stuff. Now, that was the, the shorter duration. Draw those lines, shoot them out to the left, right? Then we get this chart. It looks pretty darn close. I mean, folks, this, I'm, what I'm, this is the one, though, that is a little bit different. We can get a little bit of an incremental higher here, and this is NVIDIA. I've been using this example lately. It's tied to crypto, so crypto carries a higher volatility, uh, NVIDIA has assumed some of that volatility as well. So that's why with some of these, I've said you got to think of like an incremental higher uh, with volatility as of recently, because when I shoot those lines out to the left, you can see that we are uh, seeing 
the lows as that previous resistance uh, that we had right here on this line has now come support for this underline. All right. So I've got a new uh, trend channel going here. So with that said, you know, some of you guys might be calling my bluff right now. And that's great because that's what really makes a market. You guys might be saying, no, I think it's going to go back down to this area. So, you know, it's still in that upper half sell zone, if you will. Whereas I'm saying, because we are back down to this support area that used to be resistance is low. Okay. So I'd be putting my dotted line in here and this is uh, the sell zone, right? That's low or a buy. Yes, it could drop down here, but I do not, I do not believe that it's going to go down to that level. I think that's out of the question, especially as it's tied to crypto. Now, if crypto drops out of bed and that's no longer a thing and NVIDIA goes back to a $30 stock, then that, that's a different story <laughs> altogether. All right. So if I haven't beaten this dead horse enough for you guys, volatility is the key driver of pricing. Now, a lot of you guys have been sitting out there and you're thinking Delta right now or Theta. You might be thinking time decay, right? Where you're thinking, hey, Wolfman, dude, you look out at those 300-day out options. You ever go out that far? You know, Mr. Risk? Uh, yes, and I have. Those options out there are not cheap for the 100 strike. If I'm looking at an underlying that's trading around 100 and I go out 300 days and look at that 100 strike, it's a hell of a lot more expensive than the one that is trading, you know, 20 days out, that same $100 strike. Well, that's because that 300 days, that one, I have to pay for the time to be right, folks. Seven days ago, we already talked about this. Seven days ago, we pretty much know what's going to happen in the next couple of days, right? I mean, we've gotten a lot of economic data just this week. We got a pretty good idea what's going to happen the next week. What, 100 days out? It's a little bit more vague, right? 300 days out, one full year from now, it's almost impossible to tell, right? But that's why those are more expensive. It's because you are paying for time to be right. Seven days, you only have a short time frame to be right, okay? So those are a little bit expensive. It's a little less risk. But the longer ones, those further out ones, yeah, you got a lot of time to be right, 100 or 300 days. Anything could happen. So yes, those are expensive, but that's because you're paying for time. You're paying for each day that you add on to it, okay? Volatility at any time can go up or down, right? Those ones that we're talking about way out in time, just dealing with the price for theta, well, that can only go down. Theta can only go down, right? Underlying moving up and down, yeah, that can make the price fluctuate based on the underlying moving. I'm not going to lie. But what I'm saying is if the underlying doesn't move a penny, it's flatlined and volatility goes higher, you're going to be watching those prices in the option montage trickle up. All right? All right. So we've talked a lot about pricing. We've talked a lot about the underlyings. I've got a bearish market here. A lot of you guys could probably chart this out better, find a target for me. But what I'm saying is we've got lower lows, lower highs in NVIDIA. Now, it is tied to Bitcoin. So if you guys are thinking you like to trade Bitcoin and uh, want to get in that game, I would suggest newer traders trade the lagging indicator, right? Never trade the leading indicator like oil. Like you want to trade oil for oil for whatever you think you're want to do we if you love to lose money then you're be a great oil trader but um with the underlines we can watch bitcoin and then the next day see that same move happen over here in nvidia sometimes they happen in the same day but nvidia is going to trail whatever bitcoin does so you can get in on the watch the move in bitcoin start to happen and then jump over to nvidia and trade that because it's going to follow it more likely than not. They are directly correlated. Uh, so with that said, I don't know right now. I'm at a real, I have a, a real conundrum because gold, um, 
Bitcoin are not quite reacting the way I would have expected them to react with this type of inflation. I would have expected gold to at least be at 2000 right now. And I'm not a gold bug, but when the market is cratering and it's down 20% and, you know, yeah, a lot of folks are saying, hey, we're back to pandemic. Well, before the pandemic, we thought we were looking pretty good, guys. So if we're at the top of where the pandemic was and the economy is, you know, where we are, I wouldn't say it feels like our economy right now is as good as pre-pandemic. I mean, pre-pandemic, that economy was like a, a freight train, right? Uh, now we got a goat cart or something. Um, so anyway, the markets, this market, NVIDIA is going to follow Bitcoin. So I don't know, to be honest, if, if Bitcoin or NVIDIA is going to pop or drop. I do see volatility is relatively low. I, I, you know, you might be worried about this. Um, I'm not too worried about it, but for this strategy, and I'm going to let the cat out of the bag a little bit here, but with the butterfly, even though it's a short call butterfly, remember I talked about usually you want high volatility when you're talking shorts, but this is a butterfly. It is morphed into something else. So when we were looking at, uh, when we're looking at butterflies, it's kind of like that mid range, um, so that's a good sweet spot, middle to lower. If you go too high, what happens with volatility, and this is something I've forgotten to talk about for uh, a couple of these videos as well. So with this one, I'm talking about we want some low volatility. I've been talking strike locations when we get to the strategy, okay? I will talk specific strike locations and deltas and all that stuff. But one of the things that I want to talk about with that is this butterfly will work exactly the same in high volatility as it does in the medium to low volatility, okay? You're going to be going for those same strike locations I talk about because we talk about the deltas that we're going to be using. Well, those are going to still, you're going to find are the same. But if you compared a $100 stock again, compare apples to apples, 100 to 100, if we were to look at those two underlyings, and the volatility is extremely high for this one and extremely low for this one. Well, what we would see is those wings of that butterfly on the volatility that's really high are really wide, okay? So that means the expectation of a big move, all right, maybe I should bring it in so you can see my hand. The expectation of a big move is going to happen. Now, with the short call butterfly, we need a big move to happen. So in order to get that, we really want to kind of be a contrarian in the sense where the market doesn't believe that big move has happened. Market says, I think it's going to happen like this. And we say, we think it's going to happen like this. So you put, that's when you would do the short call butterfly. You think that the market is going to make an outside paced move, all right? Or outside a marker maker move is what we would call it on the floor. Uh, market maker move is based on 80% of the straddle. That gives you where you think the range is going to be on uh, an underlying. So we expect this to make an outpaced move from what the uh, market is predicting. Okay, so we want to make it blow out outside the wings. Um, all right, so let's get back to the content. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself in this video for some of you folks that have been watching. All right, so let's go over this real quick before we go over to the option montage. Remember, what is our only major rule over the option montage? Uh, if I'm looking at a stock, let's call it XYZ, right? Over in the option montage, the rule is that everything's based on an advancement, right? That's all we need to know. It's based on one advancement. So if I'm looking over there at Delta, it's based on one advancement, right? Of a dollar, all right? So it's a $1 advancement. So that's telling us that when XYZ is trading 100, that means it increases to 101, right? So now we're trading 101 in that sense. So Delta, when we're looking at the at the monies, so I'm gonna say this is the at the money options. We can say these are the calls over here, calls and puts. I'm going to try and give myself a little bit of more room today. 
um, and we're trading at the 100 level. So those at the money options are the 100 strikes. Okay, those are at the money. Those are the ones that are trading close to the, as close to the underlying as you can get. Now, the ones that are at extremes, those are either in the money or out of the money. Say, for instance, an in the money call. A call gives you the right, but not the obligation to buy the underlying. So a call that is below where the underlying is trading. So if I buy a 95 call and the underlying is trading 100, my 95 call is in the money because of course I would want to buy it below where the underlying is trading, right? Everybody would want to buy Apple at 95 when it's trading 100 or XYZ, right? So that's in the money. Now, there's some that are above the market on the calls. If they are, tra if I'm trading 100, the 105 calls are considered out of the money, right? Because who wants to buy Apple at 100 when it's trading in the market? Or who wants to buy Apple at 105 when the market's trading 100? You want to pay above it? No, nobody does. All right, so those are out of the money. Out of the money are the ones you don't want to do. On the put side, if the underlying's trading 100, puts at the 105 strike are, throw it in the box, in the money or out of the money. Puts trading at 105, underlying's trading 100, the puts are in the money. That's right. Because puts give you the right, but not the obligation when you're buying, to sell the underlying at 105. And if it's trading 100, sure would like to sell it at 105. That's better than 100, generally speaking, right? Right. So, and puts below the market. I don't want to sell Apple at one or at 95 when it's trading 100. Okay. So, at the monies are 50-50. Because that's based on the probability, folks, that when you buy and sell stock, that it'll either uptick or downtick is a 50-50 probability from when you bought it. So at the money, the 100 strike are usually around a 50 delta, and it's usually a dot 50 delta, okay? So if XYZ increases $1 to 101 even, one exact dollar, the at the money deltas will go into the premium. So if the calls were two dollars at two fifty, and the puts were two dollars at two fifty, just to make math easy for us all, me more importantly, <laughs> the call delta is plus fifty. The put delta is going to be negative fifty, right? Because it's based on an advancement puts get less valuable as the underlying moves higher, okay? Like you don't want to sell it way down there when the market's moving higher, right? So those are less valuable if we're assuming an advancement, all right? So Delta, we're based on a $1 increase. These premiums would go to $2.50 at $3. The puts on the other side, because they're negative and we advanced higher, would drop by that 50 cents. So we would see them go to, from a, uh, to a dollar fifty at two dollars. All right, so that's on that first dollar move. Uh, puts are negative. Now, if we go down, you just have to add the negative. You just go back to your math, guys. A negative plus a positive makes it a negative, right? So if the underlying moves down by a dollar, that negative plus the negative delta in the puts makes it a positive to your position, right? Now, the next one is that nobody really talks about is gamma. And gamma goes with delta on dollar number two. So now this is increased again to 102. And gamma usually on those at the money is, let's just call it around five cents. It varies. It's usually not very much, guys. It's usually less than 10 cents for sure. But it's, it's different based on the price of the stock, of course. So gamma goes with delta on the second dollar. So this five cents goes into those premiums that we had before. So on the second dollar move higher, now we got 55 cents going into this. So now it's 305 at 355 on the call side. The puts, five goes into 50. Now it's 45 cents. So now we would be looking at a dollar five at a uh, dollar 55. Because 45 cents now comes out of this because 
Gamma goes with delta. It's positive on this side. It's negative on this side. So then it only decreases by five cents there. All right. That makes sense to everybody? Throw a, throw a Y over there in the chat window. If, if it doesn't make sense, throw an N over there because uh, I'll drill down on it some more. So gamma goes with delta on the second dollar move. Now, the next one we want to talk about is the thief. The thief of the night that comes and steals your premium. This is theta, right? Theta comes every single night and never relents, right? Always is going to be stealing money, all right? That's theta. So theta is always negative because it's based on an advancement, right? An advancement of a day. How many times have you guys gone back in time, right? So with theta, it always is negative. It's always going to be eroding those premiums. Tomorrow you wake up, theta has taken money out of those premiums, okay? You cannot stop it. You can take advantage of him, right? How could you take advantage of theta helping you out? What's the one thing you could do to make theta help you out? That's right. It's selling. If you sell high, you can buy low. You can short it in a sense. All right. So theta, while it isn't consistent, all right, it, well, it's kind of consistently increasing. Yeah, what I mean is it's not linear. It's not binary. Like it doesn't just cut off. Uh, it is slowly eroding. And what we see happen is way out in time, it really doesn't go anywhere. And then all of a sudden it picks up and then drops off a cliff. And when it drops off that cliff is usually right around seven days to expiration. All right. That means when I mean by drops off a cliff means that is the amount of money coming out of your pocket. That's your, what's happening to your premiums because of theta. And then basically we look right here. This is right around 35 days to expiration. That's when we start to see the pickup happen. Now, what I say to folks is 45 days to expiration is where I'm starting to move to the, uh, the sell aspect, right? Inside of 35 days to expiration is the sweet spot for selling options. Why? Because you sell high and you buy it back low. You just let theta do the work for you. And then basically outside of 70 days to expiration, we really see that, that like slow down. That It's not as steep of a move there. So you can catch a little bit of time before it really starts ramping up. I didn't do a very good drawing of that, but you guys get the picture, right? And then finally, the most important Greek is Vega. What's Vega? Anybody know? Implied volatility. It's just a fancy name for implied volatility. It shows up in the option montage, which is a page with all the calls and the puts. That It shows up there as Vega, all right? It's... It's a Greek that's not a Greek, <laughs> meaning Vega is just not really a Greek letter. Uh, but Vega is the most important of the non the Greeks, uh, of the Greeks. All right. I didn't want to confuse anybody there. And Vega is always positive because it's based on an advancement. All the premiums go up. Negative move in volatility. Volatility Vega goes down by one percentage point. What does that do? Negative to all the Vega coefficients, right? So implied volatility is Vega, and as the market move, as implied volatility moves up and down, we could just say options prices are expensive up here. Uh, let's say three dollar signs, and down here they're like one dollar sign. Okay, so Vega is really the thing that determines pricing. Um, and one thing to note, theta. When it gets more aggressive, we talked about that. That is near or closer and closer to expiration. It gets more and more aggressive. Volatility, on the other hand, is more aggressive way out in time, right? And a, a, a really bad Chevy. That's a good, <laughs> nice one. Um, uh, yes, we'll be here all day, comedy hour. Um, so uh, Vega affects further duration options a lot more, all right? Because that's more unknown, right? There's more angst about that 
uh, way out there. Near next couple of days, I know pretty much what's going to happen in the next day or two. I've got a pretty good idea. At least I'm pretty confident with that. So not a whole lot of angst in the next couple of days. But I'm starting to think about way out in time. That's a little bit vague. All right. So veg is equivalent to volatility in a sense. All right. So a couple of things to note. Delta is going to always be uh, right around 50 at the monies. Now, we talked about this a couple of times. I see Ron's here. Uh, we talked about the skew. Yes, sometimes it will peel a little bit. And um, to the call side, some of those out of the money calls might be a 50 delta. It's not always an exact science, but in theory, the at the monies. If this underlying was trading at uh, 150 even, well, 150 even would mean that these 150 uh, calls and puts would be at the money and they should be 50, 50 deltas. Not always the case. Now, gamma, like I said, goes with delta. You can see further out in time, it's not really very impactful. That's why a lot of people don't talk about it too much. But just remember, hopefully you guys will never forget What's gamma? Goes with delta. Pretty simple. Theta, always negative. And you can see that if we go out in time, and I can't see where, why is my pen not showing up there when I got a little drag there? Well, let's see if I can get it coming back. All right. Um, so when we're looking at theta, look what happens when we're looking at 130 days out. I'm just going to try and move in 130, uh, try and move in 30 days. So we'll look, we're at the at the monies, they move from eight cents to nine cents. Increase of a penny over 30 days. Next 30 days, we go from 100 days to 67. That's about 30 days. Well, from 100 to 67, we do see it increase by about three pennies, right? Then from 60, remember I said 70 days to expiration, outside of 70 days to expiration or right around there is kind of where you're going to be looking for your buying, limit that theta decay. So from 100 days to 67 days, we saw it increase by 30 or by three cents here. Now you move in another 30 days, what happens? It increases by three cents. So about the same. That's why I say you don't really need to go out to 100 days to really limit it because you're still going to lose three cents a day. Okay. So it's kind of, it's pretty close. Uh, maybe slightly more inside that 70 days. It will be slightly more. Don't get me wrong. It will be slightly more, but uh, it's not going to be an incremental move. Whereas you go from this 39 days, remember I said 35 days was a sweet spot, which is basically only getting about 15 cents a day. Well, what happens when you go in 30 days? Oh, look at that. From 15 cents to 60 cents a night. That's four times as much. So you can see that that is really where that, that drop-off is happening. It's really getting aggressive inside of that seven days to expiration is what we're looking at here. It's getting crazy. All right. And then Vega, we can see, is always positive, right? And look how it increases dramatically way out in time, right? So another reason why... When volatility is low, I want theta to be limited. I want to put him in a corner, all right? But having said that, the benefit of going out in time here is you get that that big volatility coefficient. Look inside. You almost get nothing, right? So we want to take advantage of buying and having volatility explode. So we buy longer duration when volatility is low and sell when volatility is high in the near duration because we get that volatility coming out. We sell high, volatility comes out. That helps us. Those prices start dropping. And then what else happens? You get the thief just grabbing fistfuls of money and that makes it drop precipitously, all right? Buying, we want to buy, be good stewards of our capital, limit that thief in the night, try and lock him in a corner, uh, limit that theta decay, and when volatility explodes, then we take advantage of it, even if we're wrong, okay? Volatility expanding will make a buying option uh, strategy work out better. Now, that's 99% of the time, folks. Now, let's throw a kink in this and talk about 
the short call butterfly because I mentioned this. We don't want to do this despite the fact that we're collecting a credit, despite the fact that we are um, expecting to try and collect a credit and sell high. We don't want to do that with this strategy. It's a little bit different because if volatility is already in this one, then our wings are going to be really far away. And um, we don't want that. We want our wings to be tight because we're expecting a big move. We want that big move to happen and move outside of our uh, defined risk strategy. That's another thing with this strategy, folks. It is a defined risk strategy, limited risk, so you know what you're getting yourselves into. It's a great strategy, uh, short call spreads, collecting your credit, or great strategies to get you guys used to collecting that credit and getting that feeling of shorting something, which is a little bit you know, counterintuitive to some folks. Now, when I'm doing this strategy, I usually go to just out of the money or, you know, slightly higher than where we're trading. I, I don't like to really go in the money on this one. Um, and the other thing we're going to be doing, we're going to be selling those pretty much at the monies, the 50 deltas, or sorry, we're buying those 50 deltas, I'm sorry. And then, so we're going to buy these at the monies and then... What we're going to do, we can see we collected about uh, $9.60, say we're buying the offer. We do that twice. Well, sometimes I talk about moving that incrementally out. Basically, what you're going to have to do is you're going to go and look for the two that are in the money that are closest to 90, right? So we're, we're buying the 50 deltas and then looking to sell the 90 delta and the 10 delta. So you can see that I ended up going with the uh, 95s here, which is a seven delta. I had to go a little bit further out to the 15s, which was the 90 delta. So I ended up having to do uh, the 90 deltas on this, but that's kind of where we're starting. We go straight to that 90 delta, look at it. And then when we get our credit, it's risk one to make one. All right, it's risk one to make one. And it's with the call side, guys, it's usually a little bit less than that. So the short put butterfly, I'll explain why it's a little bit better next week. I don't have a whole lot of time to do that this week, but you can see uh, we're collecting a 26 credit on how wide are these? $40, right? So it's a $40 wide spread from 115 to 155 or 155 to 195 is $40 wide. And we're collecting 50% of the width. So that's another thing you, you know, collect 50% the width. All right, of one of the spreads. It doesn't matter which one you're looking at. I usually, just go from the 115s to 155s, think it's 50, I need $20, or it's 40, I need $20. And that's kind of where I broke this out. So you can see it on the a risk reward analyze tab, risk one to make one or as close to that as I can get, you know, for government work. Um, something I want to talk about, how does this strategy end up working out so well like this? Or why is it breaking the rules really better yet? Um, so let's pull this over here and look at uh, NVIDIA. <clears throat> so I'm looking at selling the option strategy. So with that said, I am still looking to do this in something that is, <laughs> I pulled this up, um, basically those shorter duration options. You know, as you can see that I'm using those August there. So that's the shorter duration option. Even though I'm collecting a credit, I'm doing it in low volatility. I still want fade on my side because I collected a credit. Anytime you're collecting a credit, you collect that credit, you want it to go down in value so you can buy it back cheaper, All right? So that said, while this breaks the rule of volatility being when we collect a credit, it needs to be at an extreme level. The butterflies are a different beast. They break the rule on that just a little bit because we want to be successful, 
have this underline go outside of those wings. But we still want to take advantage of the nearer duration because of that theta component. But the idea here is when we're looking at this and I'm buying that 115 uh, call spread or selling 115 call spread, meaning I buy this call, sell the 115s. What kind of call spread is that? It's a short call spread, right? Because I collected a bigger credit than I bought. So it's a short call spread. What do you want with a short call spread? If I have a short call spread, I want the underlying to go higher because I have a short call spread on. That is a bullish uh, trade. So if this underlying moves higher, then my credit will go to zero, right? Which means all of that credit went to my profit. So if this underlying moves higher and these calls basically go way out of the money, I would make my money on this credit spread. I would lose money a little bit on the other one, right? The short call spread. But if you get that outside paced move, what's happening is this one, if I got a big rally, this one is losing money. And that credit is more than the debit of the long call spread, which would be if I had the long call spread on 55, what did I go 40 wide? The long call spread would be gaining in value, right? So these, sorry, I may have just said that backwards. Uh, if we rally, I did say that backwards. If we rally, the short call spread is going to lose money on that, right? I did say that backwards. I'm sorry, folks. Let me start all over. So if we're looking at the short call spread here, we want this underlying. Nobody was correcting me over there. Come on, Ron. Come on, Zeke. <laughs> I know you guys are usually on top of it. Where's Trevor? <laughs> All right. So the short call spread, if this underlying rallies, this one's going to hurt me. Uh, the long call spread, though, which is the same at the money strike, but then the $40 wide, this one that was basically worth pretty much nothing. Market moves higher. This one, the debit is going to massively increase. The credit spread on this side can't really hurt me a ton. It'll hurt me a little bit, but look, $25 wide and I've got $35 wide there. So not a whole lot of hurt left in this strategy. But now, if the underlying had dropped, gone down, then the short call spread, sorry for the confusion earlier, the short call spread would then be the one that gained in value, right? Because then the credit would go down. These would go out of the money and be almost worthless. So the other debit spread would lose value as well. But uh, this one is going to massively lose that value if we start selling off. Okay, that makes sense. This one would help us out more. So the bottom line is, is you have a short call spread and a long call spread jammed together. So with that said, you're saying the short call spread, I want it to sell off. The long call spread, I want it to blast off. So you've got to have both of those happen because you are playing it to one or the other, All right? So we do have two break evens on this because the markets can't go the same direction at the same time, right? We're either gonna go up or we're gonna go down. So this credit is in my pocket. So that helps me out with my break evens. If the underlying moves higher, we were talking about our short strike here on the upside is 195, that's way up here. That's my short strike. My break even is way back. $20 higher than the 55, so right around 175, $20 into the 55, we got 175. Subtract it to the downside, and we've got 135 to the downside is our break even. So this credit spread helps us get to our break evens quicker. All right. So the product of this strategy is two call spreads jammed together to try and get out of this strategy. All right. Now I talked about in the last couple of videos. Would I leg out of this strategy? 
Now, this one's going to be way too difficult to mess around with, guys. Just take it. You get that big move one direction or the other. Just take it off when when you've seen uh, about a higher risk tolerant person, 50% reduction in your premium. But I would go at around 25 to 30%. All right. That's what I'm looking for in this strategy. Butterflies take a long time. You have to have the patience of a saint. Um, so that's why I'm a little bit more inclined to take uh, less than 100% profit. I never take 100% profit in anything, folks. I always get out of it early. And I'm happy with that because I would rather get out of it, retool and die and move on to the next thing. Take my quick hits and get out, right? So this one, I am not going to look to try and leg out. No. All right. So uh, I don't know why I have the XOP up there again. Uh, that was from last week's slide, I guess, left over. All right. Oh, I all right. Well, you get this off this one more time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to copy it over here. This. Um, all right. I thought we were going to do this the last. I messed up for you guys. So you guys have one last chance to get this offer. I won't be offering this anymore. I just uh, have the wrong slides in here. So I'm going to give it to you. Um, so you get 15 hours of content guys, and it's over 15 hours of content easily. Uh, rising interest rates. Anybody worried about the next one percentage point increase in interest rates? If you're not, I can scare the crap out of you by watching this video. If you haven't been lowering overall cost basis, you really should. Uh, if you've ever wanted to learn how to trade that blue um, side uh, chart that I have on my charts, that's the market profile. Show how to trade that and uh, quickly understand when, where, and why we're buying these options. A little bit more layered on. Like this video, I try to concentrate a little bit more on volatility than I normally do because this is really looking at the key to the options trades. And I think that that is volatility. But some of those other ones, I will break it down from build, uh, build and build from simple concepts to real life examples, but I will be more hyper focused on different aspects than I have in this one. This one, um, I wanted to really drill down on this options volatility, uh, being implied volatility. All right, so this is kind of like the page that you'll come to with that uh, link click, um, and. These are some of the videos as an idea. You know, you get to this video, you watch it, and it'll put a check mark there for you so you know you've already watched it. And the reason why we do that is because, like I said, I do, I've done a short call butterfly a couple of other times, but I'm concentrating on different things in those videos. So, yes, when you watch one, say you watch the short call butterfly and you, you got the uh, video package, go in there and look for another short call butterfly like right away because i usually say watch this video again but watch a short call butterfly again right after this that will make it sink in your uh long-term memory a little bit better all right because it will reinforce that uh and these are some of the things that you'll get there uh what, what is this uh is there assignment risk of the lowest short call from the start yes zeke there is great question let me go back to that um, real quick. Short call assignment risk on that option. Where is it? Where is the, oh, I got to go back. Okay, here we go. So the short call that he's talking about is the one that's the in the money one. This one right here. Okay. So this one is in the money from the start. So what it's saying is I'm selling that call, meaning I have the obligation to sell the stock at that underline or at that price, right? Well, that said, with 35 days ago, almost nobody ever does that. It's usually going to happen within seven days to expiration or something like that when people are pretty sure they're right, okay? Not when it's 35 days out and they don't necessarily know. So um, yes, there is some assignment risk there, but keep in mind, it is a defined risk strategy, meaning that I sold that call at the 115 strike. And remember, when I sold that strike, it comes with a benefit. So a lot of people, you know, get hung up on these underlyings being in the money and there's some assignment risk on these, let's say the 115s, right? So I think that's 115s, those 90s, <coughs> excuse me. 
But if I collected $40, right? Or what's right in the mid market, 38, something like that. Let's just say I collected $38, right? Now 115, let's do this math up here. 115, which is my 115 calls plus 38, right? Because I collected $38. We add that all up. We've got three, five, one, 153, right? So if I sell that call, that 115 call right now for $38, I synthetically sold the underlying $2 higher. So that's pretty rough assignment risk. You just made me steal $2 from the market. You know, some of that's a product of volatility and, and theta and all of those other things. But the in the money options always have to carry a benefit, meaning the difference between this 115 strike and where the underlying is trading. So we're talking 30, what is that, $36? These options can now go below $36 if the underlying is trading right here at 151 because it has to include the benefit of that option. So yes, you would have the assignment risk. Somebody could come in there and, and do that to you. But the fact of the matter is because you collected a credit and it's right there at where it was, then you're pretty good. And on the flip side, because you've created a strategy and you you bought a couple of options here, those are going to help you out also. Remember, if somebody stuck it to you with that one, you have the other call, <clears throat> the long call, that you can just offset that assignment risk, okay? One thing I always say to folks also as a trader, especially as a trader, never go through that assignment process. It's too cost intensive, all right? It's better to go out and just get out of the option and then do whatever you wanted with the stock, okay? For one, trading stocks, the uh, fees are gone, so that doesn't cost you anything. They still give you assignment risk or assignment fees and everything else, and those are pretty hefty. So stay away from that. Don't go through that process. It's a friggin' headache. If somebody does it to you, just remember this is a defined risk strategy, all of those things. Even if you sold a short call in the money naked, Nobody's probably going to do it because 70 to 150 is 85, uh, 80, 81 in this case, right? And what are these trading at? Well, nobody would ever trade that one. That's because the market was closed. But these would, I would be bidding 81 for them, right? Because they should include the benefit. Does that make sense for everybody? If it does, throw a Y over there for me, please. If it's not, throw an N over there. I'll, I'll come back to it, All right? So the ones that are the calls and these are in the money, they have to include that benefit. The puts are the same way. They're in the money, but they have to include the benefit. Meaning without even knowing anything, I can look at these 195. Uh, let's look at something that's a little tighter. Uh, 160. These have to at least be worth because they're puts, right? And then we know that the underlying is trading 151 have to be worth at least $9. And we can see that there's they're worth more than $9. So you can always double check yourself when you're doing the option pricing on this one. Uh, where was it here? You see somebody bidding $79.95? If somebody hit him on that, they were silly because the value is 81. All right. That makes sense. All right, good. All right, like I said, that's your offer for today. Thank you guys for sticking around the whole day. Please make sure you guys subscribe, hit the like button. Oh, wait, the subscribe when you get that little bell. The little bell will let you know when I'm coming in unannounced on the morning market videos. So if you guys want to take advantage of me talking about uh, how I think the markets are going to react, well, check that out. Hit the little bell. It'll let you know when I pop in unannounced. These videos are pretty much uh, lockstep in line with the timing. Morning ones, uh, I'm usually a little early. All right, so if you can't take that, take it easy.